Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session, The Transformation of the Developer Security Relationship, a very, very important topic for, for uh, DevSecOps transformations uh, in, in every single organization. Uh, my name's Simon Maple. I'm the field CTO here at Sneak, and I'm very, very happy to introduce my guest, uh, Rinky Sethi. Rinky is the uh, Twitter CISO. So, Rinky, a very warm welcome to SneakCon. How's things? Hey, Simon. Good. Thanks for the introduction, and it's an honor to be here. Awesome. Well, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to have you. Why don't we, uh, why don't we start by uh, hearing a little bit about uh, what you do, what your role is uh, as CISO of, uh, of Twitter? Yeah, I joined Twitter just about a year ago. Man, it's like very crazy to say that it's been about a year. Um, I, um, as the chief information security officer at Twitter, I'm here to serve, um, you know, we are here to serve the public uh, conversation and I'm here to help protect the public conversation and ensure that people can communicate effectively and the right news gets in the right people's hands at the right time accurately. Um, and so uh, internally that translates into ensuring that we have a really good security program that we're protecting our data in the right way and we're partnering across engineering and the business to build the right security practices and the right risk framework to enable uh, leaders to make the right decisions so the business can move quickly. Uh, really important job and, and certainly a very, very popular platform as well, which many, many millions uh, use, I'm sure. So why don't we start by, you know, obviously today we're going to be talking a little bit about how developer and security roles have changed over time, uh, particularly as organizations go through these digital transformations. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey, uh, you know, from where you started going into uh, finally, you know, this, this CISO role at Twitter. How did that, uh, how did that work out? Yeah, so I started as a security engineer during the dot-com bust uh, almost two decades ago. And um, I remember when I started as a security engineer, the term CISO was not well known. And uh, most companies outside of banks didn't really have a CISO. The company I worked for definitely didn't have one. Um, and information security was still being defined. In fact, the first team I worked for wasn't even called information security. It was called information protection. And I was an information protection analyst. And so that's kind of where I started my career. Um, since then, I've worked in various different roles. I joined Walmart as a security engineer. I went to eBay to drive security culture change, uh, led product security at Intuit, um, went over to run security operations at Palo Alto Networks, um, had a short stunt, a stint running enterprise security at IBM. And then I took my first CISO role at a company called Rubric in the backup recovery cloud data management space. Uh, and then a year ago, joined Twitter as the CISO. Um, I've ran various different aspects of security and have seen security just morph and change and elevate um, in terms of importance over the last two decades. So it's been a really interesting journey. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting how, you know, even, even major roles like a CISO, how, how that kind of thing has changed even, even in a couple of decades, which is, which is very significant. Um, and, and I think, you know, e even wider and broader, development has changed so significantly as well, including some core changes to things like the way we develop agile methodologies coming in, uh, you know, allowing us to, to, to develop much faster and shorter intervals, DevOps methodologies coming in to allow us to release daily, multiple times a day, um, and, and DevSecOps really pulling security into that mix. So in terms of, you know, some of the organizational changes or challenges that you have seen uh, over the last, you know, however many years, what are some of the core changes that you've seen to teams and organizations uh, through, through these times? Yeah, I mean, developments, like you mentioned, development has just taken a complete drastic change, right? And how people work. I mean, how you used to develop two days, decades ago, you can't even survive in the, in the way that people develop today. And um, the use of open source and those kind of things didn't exist as much, right, decades ago. So it, things have changed completely. When I think about 
what that means for security specifically. I remember the days where we used to go and train developers. We used to sit there and do manual code reviews. There was some level of automated scanning, but it didn't work well at all. And you relied a lot on pen testing. Even the uh, tools and the tech back then wasn't that good. So you were like really relying on how do you train developers to not do bad things and how do you scan for the OWASP top 10? And that's changed so much now. Like you said, releases happen many times a day, if not even like hourly or more often than that. And you have these agile work environments and no longer can you go in and do manual code reviews and things like that. You have to rely on automation and enabling development teams to really run security on their own without slowing them down, but helping with their velocity. And so things have changed just, just drastically. And, and I think, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's, let's go a little bit deeper now and talk either you know, security or developers. Where you know, let's talk about some of the main changes that have happened in each of those departments. So, um, obviously, organizations have changed, but also activities, processes, and those kind of things which uh, which they each need to uh, you know work into. So, what are some of the core changes that day to day affect each of those roles? Yeah, I mean, I think when you think about um, development teams compared to security orgs, development teams are huge and security orgs are really small. And what you learned in building security teams, even early on, and something that's actually remained the same is that you can't scale by just hiring more and more security folks. Um, and because the tooling didn't exist before, you did see the scaling through people. Now, I think you see a lot more in terms of tools and automation. And I remember security um, being more of a standard builder, being more of you can do this and you can't do this. And now I think both organizations have changed to how can we partner and embed with each other rather than making like the, here's the standards, toss over the issues you find and development teams are going to go and fix it. That doesn't work. And if in, in organizations that I've been a part of where that's the way that you work, what ends up happening is security is bypassed. And so I think the things have changed and some things have remained the same. Many things have changed with both the organizations. I think what's happened too is um, having these well-defined SDLCs, right? And where you don't have an SDLC and you don't have good hygiene and practice, it's hard then to plug in security and to know what tools and services might fit in. And over the, I would say last decade, you start seeing now, even in boardrooms where you're discussing the health of an SDLC, how security and privacy are plugged into that SDLC? What does that definition look like? Is it adopted across the board? Um, and so lots of changes, not in just the development organization and security, but how this is thought about as an ecosystem that enables the company to thrive on. Mm. And, and that's interesting what you say, actually, because over time, is it fair to say, would you agree that over time, developers have had, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, developers have had to go through a, a number more changes. So like when, you know, as, as you talk about um, things like, you know, whether it's DevOps or Agile, there are a number of changes that developers need to go through, breaking down the silos between developers and operations and, and, and working through that DevOps space. So adding security into that flow where you've already got a good DevOps pipeline is is that, is that potentially easier because the developers are more malleable to those kind of changes? Um, would you say that developers have gone through a lot more change than security teams have pre DevSecOps? I mean, security's changed and developers have changed. I, you know, when I think about how developments change, and this is like one of the um, the interesting things where they want to move faster and they can't allow for slowdown, right? And one of the interesting things that has changed is, and I, I love to see this happen. And I think companies like Sneak Act actually um, helped enable this and helped accelerate how we think about security and security and DevOps, which is development teams are saying, we need more automation and we need security. I want something like, you know, a, a tool like Sneak or even in other areas of the development life cycle and where security might plug in. They're coming and championing and saying, hey, Rinky, I don't have budget, but would you come and help us fund something like this? Because this would help us move faster. And it's the ideal scenario when something like that happens. Now, I think security innovation has happened. I think where things are interesting um, and security innovation has happened 
we're it's at an incredible pace and yes development teams have changed but security teams have had to change to keep up too in terms of mindset tooling all of it um and now what's happened is security teams are being pulled in and i think it's a really interesting paradigm shift that's happened um with how security is pulled into development and it helps with that partnership um and now security teams have to be ready with the tools and services to plug into this new environment and this new way of developers trying to pull um but i feel like it's one of the biggest wins when something like that happens mm. and what would you say i mean you know you're talking about security being pulled in uh, to development organizations do you, do you see um wh where do you see that pull and push is it do you see developers wanting to reach out to security teams or do you see uh, security teams almost trying to impose these security practices on developers what are the, the, I wish the, you know, some of the areas that that works yeah, I wish I had a clean answer to that one. And I wish I had, uh -huh. yes, it's always a pull. It's not, unfortunately, right? It's still a push and pull model. There's areas, and you know, I think um, this is where it gets really interesting because there's areas in the company and, you know, for large companies, there's multiple development teams usually, and each development team has different um, like type of security hygiene, different type of security culture. And I think what's interesting is to find that role model team that you can latch onto, which is pulling security in and leveraging that to like start pulling the others along, or I think in your analogy, pushing the others along. And I think that's a, a, that's a really uh, interesting thing, but I think there's some areas where you do still have to push where there's not that understanding. And I think the more data you can bring then to those security teams to showcase why this is so important um, is critical. And so um, I think there are teams that there's that pull. And I've had that experience in every company where you find that small champion team and leverage them to showcase how other teams should be operating. Um, but it it depends, right? And also the other thing is security teams are not always scaled. Um, and this is where you you rely on things like security champions or whatever they might they might be called at different companies. Um, to start helping you drive that culture change. And, and let's go into that a little bit because, I, I, you know, security champions are getting more and more widely used by organizations for that collaboration. How, how in, your, in your view, do you see security champions acting as a program to help that collaboration? What are the best practices you've seen around that? Yeah, you know, I've built this at multiple companies and I failed um, a couple of times before I was able to see the wins. Um, one of the things that I remember in the first time that we were building out security champions is we didn't think about the developers and the architects and the different rules in a development team, right? So what we did was we went and built out all this curriculum and all the learning that a security champion would need within a team. And then we rolled it out and within like a couple of weeks, they consumed all the content and there was nothing more to keep the program ongoing. And we realized that who were we targeting changed. Maybe we were targeting the architects more than the actual developers and developers needed different a different experience with the champions. And so who was our champion? So we went through that. So I think well-defining who your champion is, ensuring that the curriculum is long lasting, you have some incentives and you come up with what is security going to do in the core InfoSec team going to do in terms of providing services and what is the security champion's role? And then how do you get development teams to start being more accountable um, and it being a shared responsibility? So what are those scorecards and those measures of success? And you have to have that in order to make sure that your security champions program is actually working in the way you intended, because that's how you can measure success and that you're actually moving the needle. Um, and then of course, scaling security champions, sometimes you're hiring a centralized team that you call a security champions team and you spread them across development teams. Other times you're actually don't have that kind of headcount and you're relying on development teams to say, here, I'm per I'm tagging this person as a security champion. So it becomes their part-time role. Then how do you incentivize them to ensure that they're actually contributing in what you deem as a security champion to start driving what you want as goals for that security team? So uh, different models, I've tried each one of those models. And I think the most important thing is making sure it's well-defined what the shared goals are up front. And then what do you need to make that program a success? Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And, and in terms of in terms of those programs, it, it, what are some of your key takeaways from that program in terms of goals? Is it you know we talked about the OWASP top ten there? Is it education? Is it like a secure development trying to um, you know push some of the you know changes that your security team want to add to the organization through a security champions model? What what are some of the core um, changes you'd like to push through that kind of program? 
Yeah, if I had to say like there was a North Star, it would be that you want to see no incidents happen, right? Because of a vulnerability that was introduced that could have been caught had you followed the right processes. So ultimately, that's the North Star. Now, if you work backwards from there, it's are they adopting the services that have been built? Are they do they have good security hygiene? Are they trained appropriately? Do they have the right tips and tools? Um, at their hands from a security perspective, are we are the you know as you define high risk and those uh, products and features that are going to be released? Are they going through the right amount of testing? Um, and then like number of vulnerabilities as well. I think those are all important components. Um, and then ultimately, like hey, if you've never had an incident because of a vulnerability in your code is like it's very high like high hygiene and that you have releases that are like healthy that don't re, um, don't end in a security or a privacy incident, then you've done a pretty good job overall, right? And then making sure that you're continuing to do those health checks. Um, and so I think defining those scorecards is actually not hard. And you can clearly say that this team is doing an amazing job. They've adopted all the services that security has. Uh, they go and they do the threat models that they need to do. They have the right services adopted. They have the right testing at the end of the cycle. And that, you know, anything, and they haven't had as many issues. So I think that it's kind of then a scorecard that you build that can easily be presented and hopefully then they then become the role model and that could be a shared responsibility because security is developing the services for them to adopt but then they do have to adopt them mm. and and if you'll allow me to play devil's advocate a little bit here in terms of a developer who is already you know behind their feature requests their bug fixes already trying to fix production issues already trying to make something more scalable how is it how, how can we encourage developers to add security onto what is an already overloaded plate? Yeah, I, I mean, so just to I throw mean, that one in there for you, Rinky. Yeah, I think <laughs> there's two ways to do it, right? Um, and some, it's, it's one is you bring, I, I think, bringing data to the equation, showing them how you can attack their uh, app or whatever they're building, um, and showcasing like this is exactly the steps I would take to go and do that. That has never failed with a developer that I've worked with. Whenever we can, like, red team or attack their whatever it is they're building and show that this is what an attacker would have done, you need to practice better hygiene. That's a great way of doing it. The other is many of the bugs and issues they're dealing with might have been like, it, had they practiced good, like, you know, making sure that not just on from a security perspective, but they followed the SDLC and they follow the proper standards, maybe some of that could have been avoided. And you can avoid security incidents altogether because that's going to add to your backlog of stuff that you have to go and fix. And so I think those two things are the best ways. I can't say that like we're hundred percent of the way there. Uh, we still have that, A, my backlog and all the features and all the product things that I need to go develop are taking precedent over that. But I think like if, and again, like I'm not saying any organization is that I've heard of is great at this, but if you can get goals around security uh, for developers, that helps a lot because then you're starting to get to an incentive structure that matters to them. And then I think over time, they'll start seeing that because we practice good hygiene from the beginning, we're actually, our backlog's not that bad. So, yeah. I, you know, uh, your, your devil's advocate is fair. And I think it's a fair argument that we still have to deal with as security practitioners. Yeah. And, and I actually think, you know, we mentioned the Security Champions program. That's a great program, a great platform in which to add those goals, add those initiatives in. It's a, it's a really. Uh, there are so many different, there are so many different problems or areas that we want to, that we want to, uh, uh, you know, involve developers in or involve security. And the Security Champions program is really a platform that can take so many of those on. Um, how, let's take it from the, the security point of view very briefly before we, uh, before we wrap up. From the security point of view, what, what, is there a new core goal in supporting or empowering uh, the development organization uh, as part of the new DevSecOps uh, flow as well? I think the partnership is stronger. I, what I've observed is the partnership has gotten stronger. And what I'm seeing is engineering leaders are actually coming to the table now and saying, what do we need to do from a security perspective? And how can we help you champion that across the board? That's a huge shift in culture, right? Um, when you have your tech leaders kind of saying that, I think now the big challenge is that Yes, security has the services. There's really great products that exist that you can partner with them, but you have to continue to 
prove, and this is the hardest thing with security people and engineers, because engineers need like to, you have to build good credibility with them. You have to showcase that you understand the pain that they're going through. And so I think the standards are high, ensuring you're getting feedback on how things are working. If the services that you're building is like difficult to adopt or isn't proving value, again, they're going to It's going to like you have to have that constant uh, flow of communication uh, ongoing, I think, with teams. But I feel that the partnership has gotten a lot better. Um, And I think just the news has helped, too, that you can't really be lax around security. The regulatory requirement and the regulatory landscape is different these days. That doesn't allow for uh, companies to be lax. And if that's proven, you have large fines to pay. So I think a lot's changed that kind of has forced that to accelerate just the partnership along. Yeah. And just finally to wrap, Renki, it's been a great conversation. What one piece of advice would you give to development and security teams that are looking to modernize their processes and grow into that, start that journey into DevSecOps? What change should they be looking to make to better partner? Yeah, I think communicate with each other, understand the risks, figure out how you can work with each other, understand each other's pain points to a deep level. So you're feeling each other's pains um, and successes as well. And don't be shy to bring in the right third parties, I think, to support you along the way too. I mean, there's been so much innovation in the security space that you don't need to rely on the old ways of doing things. So I think researching what new ways there are to do things to, and again, looking at this from a developer mindset, I think can help bridge that partnership in a really meaningful way. So um, I would say that the communication is key and that the, you know, again, if you put yourselves in this saying always is true, but if you put yourself in their shoes for both parties, I think you can understand and bridge a path to move forward. Um, And I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, unlike two decades ago, there's amazing services and technology that exist to help that story. Really great advice, Ricky. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much. Hope everyone else uh, enjoyed. And uh, thank you, Rinky. Have a great uh, sneak on everyone else. Simon, thanks for having me, everyone. 